please welcome Paulo Aruda, the author of Fast Ruby. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Right. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Paulo. I'm the author of uh, Fast Ruby and Burl.io. I don't know if you guys seen it. It's like a Ngrok competitor, so it's kind of cool. Um, so, you guys know. Uh, have you guys uh, uh, played with serverless before? Um, who here has uh, built like a Lambda function or an Azure function or, yeah? All right, the crowd is increasing every year. <laughs> so, you know, there are all those players out there and uh, purposely put my, you know, Fast Ruby together with the Giants, you know, just so it can look cooler. Um, but you can see at the bottom, you know, OpenFast, an amazing project, uh, Apache OpenWhisk2. And uh, FastRuby uh, has, was born as a, 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 an attempt to bring serverless to the Ruby community, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Uh, right. So <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, you know, when, when you see the definition of serverless out there, a lot of people talk about, you know, you only pay for what you use, and that means like meter billing. Um, and then you go to all those, the, to their websites, and all you see it's Kubernetes, containers, virtual machines, scaling, Docker. In my day job, I'm a DevOps consultant, and I spend my, a lot of time helping big enterprise to go through a DevOps transformation. And I see how painful it is to get, you know, the developer that is like 10, 15 years at the job and say, hey, you got to learn Kubernetes. Or, you know, we are adopting Docker now in the development environment. So it's, uh, there's a lot of resistance, right? So I think that the serverless movement is here to solve that problem. And I don't think it has anything to do with the way you charge people for it at all. So. Right? I guess I don't need to say anything. You guys get it, right? So, <laughs> so to me, serverless is just all about the developer experience. Um, I, created, I created a platform, but the platform is just an accessory to be able to deliver the, the experience that, I, that you know, it's free from all those bad names you saw in the previous slide. Right. And, uh, I found this other image that I thought it was cooler too, and I wanted to put it there. <laughs> so, you know, happy developers are more productive, um, you know. So, and, and an argument against the whole pricing uh, 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 talk around serverless is, um, like, if, if you could pay the same price that you pay for infrastructure today, but you could get your developers way more productive, wouldn't you take it? Right? So. Like I said, to me, the main driver of serverless adoption is the developer experience. Um, until there are tools out there that make it easy, uh, eliminate all those uh, uh, infrastructure uh, pieces uh, from the day-to-day -day, uh, job of the developer, I think that the, the adoption will be uh, slow. So I strongly believe that the future, especially of web development, is serverless. Like if you look at history, you know, like you had bare metal, and then you had like VMs, and then you had containers, and, and now you, got, you get your serverless functions. And it makes sense, like, like how many of you are developers here? Right, do you enjoy spending your time like thinking about infrastructure? Don't you want just to like code, right? Yeah, so it's obvious that, you know, if, if we developers, if that's what we want, we have the power to create it, so that's what we get. Uh, I, I found this online from 2018. It's actually funny because uh, I really think that serverless is eating the stack and people are freaking out. Uh, AWS Lambda has stamped a big deprecated on containers and that's really how I think. It's funny because I, I, uh, those big companies I work at, they sp spend like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, finally migrating to containers and I have to stand there saying, yeah, containers, really, that's really good for you when I really think that containers, like, you shouldn't be thinking about it at all. But anyways, 
big enterprise is just slow, right? So, uh, yeah, so like I said, I, I, I live in, in I, uh, it's not like I live in the future, but I think that the future is here. It's time. Um, thanks to Redis, Redis is in the heart of FastRuby, and um, uh, I couldn't do it without it, to be honest. It's an amazing tool, like watching all the other presentations and, and uh, um, uh, how they describe it. Redis, I don't see Redis as a database. To me, it's just a Swiss army knife. It's a tool that you can use for a bunch of different things. So I'll just talk a little bit of, about FastRuby before we jump into the events part. So this is actually the first time I showed this to anyone. So uh, this is the architecture behind FastRuby. Uh, basically, there is an Nginx proxy. There is a management API. There is the endpoints uh, service. That, and everything is talking to Redis. So I use Redis to store the metadata for uh, the functions and the workspaces that you create there. And, uh, and it also. Uh, works as, a, as queuing for jobs. Like every time you run a function, I actually queue a job on Redis. And I talk about this in my Redis Conf uh, uh, talk this year. So you guys should check that out. I do a demo really nice. So uh, basically, when you do a request to FastRuby, uh, I, uh, the payload of the request, like the headers, the body, and everything goes inside of a Redis uh, list. And then I have a bunch of runners that are like always warm, waiting to execute those, uh, to get this payload to execute a function. But with the payload comes a, 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 a string for the response queue. So after the, the function finishes running, it should push uh, the response to another queue, right? And the endpoint service is waiting on that queue for the response. And that all happens in like milliseconds. It's really cool, really fast. Um, the, there is a scheduler for jobs there. It's just a, a cron job. And everything is running on Docker, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm actually using Docker Swarm because there's no reason to use Kubernetes. That's a pretty simple architecture. Um, and uh, so and, and the, the, the function runners, basically, uh, they, are, they are a bunch of different containers in separate nodes that they are connected to an NFS storage. So every time when you push your code to FastRuby, it sits in a, in a shared storage among all the nodes that have runners. So there's a lot of security involved in this, so functions won't leak you know, uh, between executions, because all those runners are shared. Um, but that's not the subject of this talk, but we can talk about it later. Just come talk to me if you want to know more about it. I'll tell you everything. So why Redis? So that's, everybody had a slide, why Redis, right? So, uh, but they didn't ask us to do that, I promise. But <laughs> we, and we all say the same thing because it's the truth. Like it's the fastest out there. It's easy to use and flexible. Um, it's reliable. Uh, I have a, I've, I've built several Rails apps, and the only thing that would never stop and never go down is Redis. Sometimes we forget that it existed. It's really cool. Um, it is extensible. has a has a great open source community, and you probably already know how to use it, right? So. So let's, let's uh, imagine here an example application. So say you have a Rails app. How many of you are uh, Ruby developers? One? <laughs> all right, all right. That's for you, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jam install fast Ruby? <laughs> All right. So, you know, imagine you have a Rails app, and, you know, it's just a pretty simple. When you, right, when you sign up, it, you, you want it to create a Stripe account for the user. You want to fetch the Gravatar, Gravatar picture, and, you know, you want to send a welcome email, okay? So uh, this, I haven't written Rails in maybe a couple of years, so excuse me here if there's anything wrong there, but it should be right. Um, so you basically create a user. Um, and this is how you would do it event-driven with FastRuby. So in your Rails app, you just get, you know, create a payload, and then you do a, a, an HTTP party post to uh, an endpoint that you created. Um, you could, you could uh, use your own custom URL there, but I just put it there as an example. Um, and then you, know, you just redirect your. So basically, you create the user, and then you send a, a request to this 
to this API you created on FastRuby to trigger an event. So basically, I'm triggering the other query as a, in a query param, uh, user created, so it's just going to be something like this. So when the event gets there, uh, it will get the payload, and it will do an L push inside of a list on Redis. And then on FastRuby, I don't know if you remember from that previous uh, architecture slide that I showed, but there's an event processor. That guy is going to pick that up. And every time you create a FastRuby function um, for the next version, this is not actually up now. It's coming on 0 0.6. Uh, you can subscribe your functions to channels in the configuration file. You just say channel, and then you list them. It's a YAML file, pretty simple. And then uh, you, if you subscribe it to the channel uh, user created, every time there is an event uh, picked up by the event processor, it will fire the functions that subscribe to that channel. So in that case, I, I subscribe, you know, I got the Stripe account create, mail confirmation, and users fetch gravatar. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's the function now, that it's the entry point for the event. So remember on the Rails app, you did a, an API request, a, a post request, uh, and that's just the function that will uh, basically uh, put the event uh, uh, um, we'll, we'll actually publish the event uh, to Redis. So it's pretty simple. Uh, you just, there's a simple authorization there if, if you need to do that. Um, and it just gets the query params and just publish the event name and pass the event body um, to, the, to, uh, to, to the Redis channel. And render nothing means just a blank uh, body response with 200 as default. So when that gets there, uh, let's get, for example, the Stripe one. So on, on the Stripe account create, just basically, uh, you just require the Stripe gem, and you get the data you get from the body. You parse it because it comes in JSON format. And then uh, I omitted the, the create Stripe account. because you know, It's just an example. Um, and then you do stuff like, OK, so if the Stripe account was created, uh, publish another event, you know, just saying, hey, the Stripe account was created, so other functions could do other things based on that, um, and you pass the payload. Or if it didn't work, uh, you can just publish an event saying that the, the Stripe account failed, uh, and then render nothing, 200, if it, yeah. Then I wrote a simple example of like, okay, how do you handle retries? Um, so basically, you just set a, a, a max retries number, and then you know you get a little counter, and you kind of do like a recursive, you know, uh, <laughs> event calling. Um, so at the end of there, so you should say you publish Stripe account create a payload JSON, but I'm adding to the payload uh, the number of the retry. So um, once that function picks it up again, it will retry max five times. If it fails. It just does the same thing, publishes account creation failed, and um, returns. So there is this new feature that I wanted to show you guys, because it's coming in the next version. And I think this is, this is really awesome. I'm really excited about this. And I actually want to get your feedback if you want to talk about it later. Um, but basically, you can wrap any piece of your uh, Rails app inside of uh, this two calls, this two lines, core.new and context. And what happens is that everything that is wrapped there gets shipped to Redis on FastRuby Cloud. And then you run that piece of code together with the context that it was so that variable user comes with it, uh, the value of it. So you access it through context.user. Um, and then you run that in one of, one of the FastRuby runners. So you could basically scale your Rails app uh, just any, by, by any piece. If, you, if there is a little piece that is consuming a lot and you would have to scale the whole app for that, uh, you can just wrap that inside of a core and create a new core. The reason why I, I call it core, um, it's because uh, 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 the only way to achieve uh, parallel uh, computing with uh, Ruby is by uh, you know, running, using different uh, cores, like in, with another processor, right? Uh, uh, sorry, with another process. 
So I called it core, so you basically spin up a new core inside of your Rails app, which is really a fast Ruby runner in the cloud or self-hosted. The next version, you guys will be able to have that in your own infrastructure. So if you have a Rails app uh, with uh, Redis already, which every Rails app uses Redis at least for Sidekick, so you can leverage that. If you uh, put FastRuby in the same infrastructure, you'll be able to leverage that, so you don't need to scale the whole Rails app. Um, but, and I, uh, the previous code just had the publish, but I'm just showing here how you, would, uh, how you could wrap anything. Um, so when you ship this code uh, to FastRuby Cloud, it, it would really require the, the, the user model and then just create a user and then publish the event. So just to see how you can wrap anything in it. Uh, and like I said, the way it works, so you just put anything inside of those two uh, uh, lines of code, and Rails will ship it to Redis uh, uh, it's, it's using the same idea, just ship it to a Redis list, and uh, FastRuby would pick that up and reply, and, and it works with the same mechanism. Oh, one thing that I forgot to tell you guys is this. Okay. So you see that it says redirect to user value. So every time you spin up a new core, uh, that's actually an async call to FastRuby. So say that you put more code between you know, this, the redirect to uh, user value and that end below publish. So whatever you do there, so when you call core.new and, and you assign to user, the code that comes after that will just continue, your application continue running, and only when you need the value that is returned by the function from FastRuby, you call the variable dot value, and then the, if the response hasn't arrived yet, uh, the, the execution blocks. But in most cases, it's, it's already there, so it's pretty fast. Um, that was it.